Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is John Mellinger. I'm talking to you from balmy Springfield, Illinois, where it's a, a warm nine degrees. I hope some of you are in warmer locales. And it's my privilege to welcome you tonight uh, to uh, a SAGES webinar sponsored by the SAGES Resident Education Committee, focusing on laparoscopic cholecystectomy and going beyond the basics. We have a great program planned for you with some excellent speakers, truly some world-renowned faculty uh, speaking to us tonight. I'm looking forward very much to the program and learning from it. I'd like to go through with you at the outset here just a few brief um, recommendations for how to make the most of the webinar. First of all, we would very much like this to be an interactive broadcast and have uh, a lot of input, discussion, and questions from the participants. I would encourage you to use the chat pod, which is in the lower left corner of your screen, and to type your questions in during talks or at any suitable time for you during the program. Uh, the speakers uh, will each take a few minutes at the end of their talk to respond to questions, and we'll also have a panel discussion at the end. I'll go over the overall schedule outline in just a moment. Uh, speakers, you are welcome also to respond to questioners during someone else's talk if you see something pop up in the chat area that you'd like to respond to, by all means, uh, we, we want to make this as interactive as possible. If during the broadcast you, you lose your audio or video, uh, you should exit the webinar, close out your browser, then relaunch your browser and log back into the show. If the problem persists, you may find it helpful to restart your machine. Finally, at the end of the show, uh, there will be a web link to a SAGES survey, and we would very much cover, covet the participants uh, participating in that with us, filling it out for us so we can get to know you better and make upcoming webinars and other events as relevant as possible for you. I wanted to just make a couple comments to set the stage for the talks we're going to hear tonight. I think uh, the audience will already know that laparoscopic cholecystectomy is one of the most frequently performed surgical procedures in Western countries. And despite this high volume, there's still a not insignificant risk of common bile duct injury attendant with the procedure uh, in the 0.4% range, which translates into 3,000 injuries a year and an estimated more than $1 billion in associated costs. These costs are uh, certainly in part medical legal, but a substantial portion of them is related to the patient care issues that come up when a bile duct is injured. In terms of the experience of the surgeon, there's no question that it's more likely to encounter a bile duct injury early in one's operative experience. And also, uh, a second peak has been noted in some series later as the surgeon begins to take on more and more challenging cases as their comfort level with the basics of the procedure improves. Considering all these things, preventing and treating common duct injury appropriately when it occurs really is amongst the most important demographic issues that could face us in general surgery practice today. Hence our theme for this webinar. Our schedule after this brief introduction will include talks uh, by several people, as you see there, uh, all of whom are highly experienced uh, and well known for their contributions in the areas that they will be presenting to us. I'll introduce each speaker as we come to their talk. You'll see that their talks will be in the 20 minute range. We're going to try to allow five minutes for question and answers at the end of each of their talks. And then uh, again, we'll have a 15 minute panel discussion at the completion of our time together. I'd like to begin now by uh, just introducing uh, our first speaker. Uh, Dr. J.B. Bittner is Assistant Professor of Surgery and Director of Minim the Minimally Invasive Surgery Center at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. He's also the Program Director there for the Advanced Gastrointestinal MIS Fellowship. J.B. is going to talk to us about the difficult gall. J.B., we look forward to what you have to say. Good evening. I'd, li I'd like to thank Sages and Dr. Mellinger, really, for inviting me to participate in this webinar. And to start off the series of uh, what are hopefully going to be interactive lectures, I'm going to discuss the difficult uh, gallbladder. I uh, have nothing to disclose that's directly uh, germane to this talk tonight. So really, the objectives of my talk are to facilitate a better understanding of, of patient anatomical and surgeon factors that may predict the difficult cholecystectomy. 
I'll spend a few minutes discussing the decision-making algorithms that may help prevent injury and what options are available to manage complex situations in the operating room with particular focus on the difficult cystic duct. Um, the, to frame the issue surrounding the difficult gallbladder and the current strategies for management, um, this review by Hussein, which investigated 91 studi studies published over 16 years, really tried to identify five major categories where difficulty uh, was identified. Um, conversion rates and iatrogenic injuries during laparoscopic cholecystectomy are still high despite significant improvement over the years. And depending on the type or technique of cholecystectomy, the degree of gallbladder inflammation, the patient comorbidities, and the surgeon's experience, the conversion rates range anywhere from 0.18% all the way to 30%, whereas the incidence of iatrogenic injuries may be as low as 0% um, up to 6%. So really, risk factors for difficulty that they defined were male sex, increased age, acute, thick, chronic cholecystitis, previous upper abdominal surgery, obesity, liver cirrhosis, anatomical variation, which we'll revisit here in a little bit, cholangiocarcinoma, and low surgeon case volume, which we'll also touch on. Um, other risk factors for difficulty were wide and short cystic ducts, which I'll also talk more about, the presence of coloenteric fistulas, and most importantly, anatomic variation. Uh, atrogenic injuries and conversion rates can be reduced depending on, as Dr. Mellinger said, the surgeon's experience, um, the techniques you employ to actually conduct the cholecystectomy, and intraoperative investigations like cholangiography, which we'll get to. Um, other strategies like subtotal cholecystectomy and intraoperative cholangiography significantly reduce the complications and conversion rate, and I'll expand on that uh, with some data. The aim of the study really by Stanisic, which is shown or highlighted here, was to assess whether it's possible to accurately predict a difficult lap coli based on the usual routine available clinical workup that we get. Um, in a prospective cohort of 369 consecutive patients, um, various significant predictors of a difficult lap coli were identified. Number one uh, is the fibrotic gallbladder uh, on ultrasound or CTE. A gallbladder wall thickness that's at least or greater than four millimeters. If the patient has or complains of at least five attacks, um, where each may be a set period of time but totaling five hours, a white blood cell count that's over 10, pericholocystic fluid on ultrasound or a BMI of 30 may all um, predict a difficult lap coli. In fact, when all these risk factors are present, um, there's a pretty high sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy to, to detect the difficult uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Uh, the risk factor for prolonged operative times in lap coli can also be assessed based on the patient's characteristics um, to try to determine that preoperatively. In a study of 596 patients, 105 of them had acute coli, uh, residents were involved in well over half of these operations with a median operative time of about 80 minutes. And, and what they found when they looked for independent printers uh, for prolonged operative time by multivariate analysis were not surprising. Um, acute cholecystitis, obesity, previous abdominal surgery, male sex, and low degree of surgeon expertise. You're beginning to see the theme. Um, assessment of these factors not, really, not only helps to optimize individual outcomes for patients, but really helps improve the decision-making process um, and also um, allows for operative training of trainees as well to help them identify what's going to be a difficult lap coli. Similar to prolonged operative times, uh, a recent study demonstrated that conversion to open cholecystectomy can be predicted based on some of the parameters available preoperatively. Um, Lippmann and colleagues subjected 70 different characteristics to bivariate and multivariate logistic regression analysis to try to identify the parameters that would independently predict conversion to open cholecystectomy. Um, and, and they did this by taking lap coli patients, of which there were 1,377 of them, who underwent lap coli for benign gallbladder disease over a 71-month period, and they found that there was an 8% conversion rate 
um, to open cholecystectomy. It, the multivariate analysis really revealed similar things that you've heard before. Male gender, elevated white blood cell count, low serum albumin, pericholecystic fluid on ultrasound, the presence of diabetes and elevated total billy are independent predictors of conversion as well as those prolonged operative times. Um, they also defined the risk factor for conversion based on the number of factors present. So if, um, if one factor was present, your prediction of conversion was about 2%. But if six factors were present, your risk of conversion was as high as 89%. Um, so looking at this a little bit further, what can also predict post-op complications? Well, there was a Swiss database of over 22,000 folks who underwent lap coli. And the risk of perioperative complications were estimated based on their patient characteristics and the clinical findings, as well as the surgeon's experience. And you can see that data here. But for example, if lap coli lasts longer than two hours, the cumulative risk for perioperative complications is four times higher compared with an intervention that lasts just 30 to 60 minutes. So for a quote unquote difficult cholecystectomy, an experienced surgeon, um, if you can predict it preoperatively, really should be involved in both the decision-making process and potentially during the operation as well. So not only do patient factors matter, but so do anatomical factors. Um, the anatomical factors that may predict difficult lap coli primarily relate to abnormal anatomy, causing either confusion um, as to what is what or difficult dissection. And so really, I would submit that a healthy suspicion for abnormal anatomy, as well as the use of technical strategies to identify that anatomy, which we'll highlight in a bit, are really important in the prevention of injury from, uh, from anatomical variation. So they wanted to investigate how often this is being done, these additional investigations to help define biliary anatomy and prevent common duct injury. And so uh, one group surveyed um, American College of Surgeon members. In fact, there were 1,417 respondents. And the authors found that only 27% of these respondents defined themselves as routine IOC users. So relatively infrequent number, right? Um, interestingly, those who used IOC less frequently also had lower case volumes for lap coli had less favorable or knowledgeable opinions about the technique, and really also had the greatest opportunity to train others. So read that in as you will. Uh, the study concluded that surgeons really at greatest risk for causing common bile duct injury were those who are inexperienced or low volume surgeons, or potentially may be training others. And so these represent target groups really for quality improvement interventions uh, aimed at a broader IOC use. A follow-up survey of a similar population by the same authors investigated self-reported differences in risk-taking behaviors by the surgeons in those who did and those who did not have a reported common bile duct injury. Um, and what they found was that more years performing lap coli, um, how the surgeons were trained to perform lap coli, meaning during residency or on a weekend course, and certain practice characteristics were really associated with an increased rate of injury. The impact uh, of these extreme risk-taking preferences on the surgical decision-making really can be an important part of decreasing adverse events during lap coli. Uh, translation, don't do crazy stuff like this kid right here, right? So how can we better prevent injuries during lap coli, uh, which is what we all want to do? So one way to help uh, prevent injury is to correctly diagnose and assess the severity of gallbladder pathology. So a useful tool to help the surgeon make these determinations is the updated Tokyo consensus uh, for the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis and acute cholangitis. Um, cholecystitis, for example, is graded as mild um, or moderate, um, with those criteria shown here that, are, that may be familiar to this audience or certainly severe. And severe uh, includes the diagnosis of essentially moderately uh, moderate cholecystitis plus some type of end organ dysfunction 
um, and you can see those criteria listed here. Further, the Tokyo Consensus really outlined the guidelines permitting uh, we as surgeons the opportunity to incorporate both the disease, disease severity grade that they outlined for us with the preferred management strategy. So this is an example of the decision tree for acute cholecystitis. Um, and following that, really, this is another decision tree for the management of acute cholangitis based on disease severity grade. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Tokyo Consensus, uh, it's too detailed to go into here, but I would certainly refer you to it as it's an edu excellent educational resource. Uh, besides identifying preoperative predictive factors of difficult lap coli and appreciating the disease severity, it's important to recognize the technical strategies to prevent common duct injury, and I think you're going to hear more about this uh, during uh, the evening. The fundamentals we all learn, such as general tissue handling, recognition of anatomic landmarks, and the safe use of surgical energy really are paramount. Um, a working knowledge of evidence-based guidelines also helps us to make informed operative decisions as well, um, regardless of where those guidelines um, may originate. So um, besides identifying preoperative predictive factors um, here, if I can get this to move forward, uh, in my opinion, which I think is supported by a growing body of literature um, and probably members of this panel as well, the critical view of safety is essential um, for identifying both normal and variant anatomy, uh, performing intraoperative um, cholangiography safely and effectively, and really for me, uh, sleeping better at night, quite honestly. Uh, the critical view of safety has three requirements. Number one, there are two and only two structures um, entering the gallbladder, as you see in this image. Number two, the hepatic parenchyma is visible through the triangle of Colo, which should be cleared of fat and fibrous tissue. Uh, and number three, the gallbladder is cleared from the cystic plate. Um, in addition to and then following the critical view of safety, the next best thing is to perform intraoperative cholangiography or ultrasonography. So, in three recent comparative studies investigating the use of imaging techniques to identify biliary anatomy and prevent CBD injury, uh, all of these reports concluded that routine use of cholangiography and or ultrasonography, depending on where you practice and your, and your technical bend, resulted in fewer major common bile duct injuries. Uh, the use of routine uh, cholangiography was shown to increase the rate of CBD stone extraction and decrease the need for additional ERCP procedures, which of course speaks to cost. Strategies uh, to ligate the cystic duct vary. Um, the most common method really is the use of metallic clips. So this is obviously the next stage after your IOC. Uh, clips are safe, they're easy to use, they're inexpensive, and they certainly offer supraphysiologic cystic duct burst pressures. Rarely do clips migrate which is a complication potentially um, avoidable and it's often related to inadequate dissection or a too wide cystic duct, maybe clip crossing or some other technical issue. For lap coli, really metallic clips are the basis against which um, many of the other methods of uh, cystic duct control are compared. One study by Marsusi um, also reported on the safety of some locking clips for ligation of the cystic duct, for those of you that may be familiar or have used these. However, there's really not a lot of data for cystic duct burst pressures specifically. These clips are well known to have uh, relatively high burst pressures for other indications like renal vein for nephrectomy and so forth. Um, just no specific data for cystic ducts. Uh, one that does have data for cystic ducts are the pre-tied ligatures or endo loops which represent an important tool for controlling the cystic duct, especially the difficult one. So while these are more technically challenging than the application of metallic clips, the use of the endo loop is now really a required skill for all general surgery residents who are seeking certification by the American Board of Surgery. So in, in a relatively large uh, study and, and pretty well done study by McVeigh comparing metallic clips and pre-tied ligatures, i.e. the endo loop, uh, they found comparable safety profiles and superphysiologic cystic duct burst pressures that you can see here. 
Um, what they recommend against, um, and I think uh, I do as well, is that concomitant use of the pre-tied ligatures, the endo loop, and clips on the cystic duct at the same time is, is probably not recommended. One group also compared the safety profile and burst strength of metallic clips versus suture ligature um, when they're tied laparoscopically. Not surprisingly, the suture ligatures were more difficult to use uh, because you had to tie them either intracorporeally or extracorporeally, but they had an equivalent leak rate and, and relatively high, certainly supraphysiologic cystic duct burst pressures. The benefit really of this technique is that the cystic duct doesn't have to be transected before it's secured. Um, so as such, it might be useful uh, in the presence of a very short, wide cystic duct where retraction of that cystic duct would make use of an endo loop more challenging or, or potentially unsafe. Another technique for securing the cystic duct is the endo GIA stapler cutter. I can hear the boos already. Um, three case series of uh, 24, 92, and 58 patients reported on complications related to the use of the endo GIA staplers of the cystic duct. And the overall morbidity, I think, you can see is a bit higher than those reported in large databases where the staplers are not used. But these cases, um, in all fairness, were all selected for their uh, high degree of severe inflammation or a cystic duct that was too wide for clip occlusion. Uh, one study confirmed the higher risk of unintended postoperative ERCP for cholidocal lithiasis after stapling. So really, in my opinion, this technique should really be uh, reserved for very select circumstances and only following identification of the anatomy by critical view of safety and intraoperative cholangiography in, in skilled hands, trying to avoid it if you, if you can. An early but growing body of literature reports on the safety of vessel sealing devices also to secure the cystic duct. In general, these devices are significantly more expensive than clips or ligatures. Um, they yield lower but still superphysiologic cystic duct burst pressures and really have comparable cystic duct stump leak rates. But besides the increased cost, which is obvious, there's potential for thermal injury related to the unsafe use of these devices, um, as well as their untested applicability in the difficult cystic duct. And what do you do if their cystic duct is, is too wide for the indication of the device? So as I stated previously, one of the best methods of prevention really is understanding of the evidence, um, which is also summarized in the SAGE's guidelines that were updated in 2010. There is uh, level one grade A evidence which supports the correct identification of anatomy for which I and some other members of the panel really prefer the critical view of safety. And there's also level two evidence that supports the routine use of intraoperative cholangiography and or ultrasonography to really decrease the risk of common bile duct injury, which is what we're all trying to do. Um, the formal best practice for cystic duct control and the difficult cystic duct really has yet to be completely elucidated. So other important injury prevention strategies include ensuring a culture of safety in the OR, uh, which I really think um, Dr. Strasberg is much better to speak to than I. Um, and it's certainly a belief, I think, promulgated by um, members of our operating room team here. Uh, also familiarizing yourself with and learning to troubleshoot um, all your available equipment so you know what's available when you're managing the difficult gallbladder. Um, really reflection and reflecting on your limitations, meaning what you as a surgeon uh, know you're capable of and what your facility may or may not be capable of is important as well. Um, be patient during the dissections. Oftentimes we can get frustrated and go too fast in an effort to get the case done, and it's times like that where um, iatrogenic injury may occur. And really, keep your options open. Consider other choices like subtotal cholecystectomy, biliary drainage um, as, an, as an out. Uh, sometimes even conversion uh, is required, but really when all else fails, uh, seek wise counsel. Uh, to help prevent iatrogenic injury and keep yourself out of trouble as much as possible. So I'd also, um, again, like to encourage and thank SAGES for, the, uh, for including me. I hope um, really any of the attendees of this session will 
strongly consider attending SAGES this year in Salt Lake City. It's a great educational opportunity. And again, Dr. Mellinger, I, I appreciate the invitation this evening. Thank you very much, JB. That was a great summary, and uh, thanks for getting the ball rolling here. We have time uh, for about four minutes of questions specific to Dr. Bittner's talk. I would encourage uh, members of the audience uh, participants to uh, type in in the chat room, and we can relay those uh, to Dr. Bittner, or he can see them as they come up. Um, JB, just while we're waiting for any questions that may come from the participants, would you comment briefly on uh, how you use aspiration of the gallbladder or decompression of the gallbladder, in uh, particularly in acute cases? Uh, and also, uh, maybe just describe briefly uh, what you mean when you use the term subtotal cholecystectomy? Sure. So um, to address your first question, uh, the use of aspiration, which I utilize a needle either percutaneously or through a, uh, through a trocar, I often use when it's um, a gallbladder that's difficult to grasp and elevate cephalad. Um, those tend to be the uh, acute cholecystitis, uh, cholecystitis cases or the um, chronic cholecystitis cases, cases uh, with uh, distended gallbladder or high drops of the gallbladder. Really aspirating the gallbladder in that situation, um, either completely or a majority, um, allow for better retraction of the gallbladder and potentially better visualization of the gallbladder, um, at least in my opinion. I think the idea to ensure that good visualization is ultimately to achieve the critical view of safety so that you can transect and control the cystic duct appropriately. Um, as far as subtotal cholecystectomy, there's um, various ways that that can be done. You stay above the, um, the cystic duct infundibulum junction so that you know that you're not injuring um, the common bile duct. Again, uh, trying to achieve the critical view of safety before doing so is ideal. Um, the Residual infundibulum then can be controlled in, in different ways. You can certainly laparoscopically or via open technique over sew that um, a residual infundibulum. Um, you can endo loop that residual infundibulum, and I have seen some, although I have not personally uh, stapled across the infundibulum as well. Um, and I would say see my previous data with regard to potential complications associated with stapling. Um, all of that is uh, in an effort to try to stay clear of and avoid the common duct um, and come back, uh, you know, if you need to another day for ERCPs or subsequent procedures should they develop uh, stones in the residual amount of gallbladder that may be present. Wonderful. In, uh, in the interest of time and to stay on time, I'm going to uh, hold off on uh, bringing other questions uh, up verbally, but there's a couple uh, coming through to you, JB, in the chat okay. room, and maybe you can respond to those uh, as we move on to our next talk. And thank you for a great summary. I'd like to now uh, introduce uh, our second speaker, uh, Dr. Mike Brunt, who's going to talk to us about prevention of bile duct injury. Dr. Brunt is Professor of Surgery and Director of the MIS Fellowship, as well as Co-Director of the Washington University Institute for Minimally Invasive Surgery. Uh, Dr. Brunt is also the President-elect of SAGES, and uh, to all of us uh, involved in this webinar, he's been a colleague, a friend, and a mentor uh, and leader in our field for many years, and we look forward to his upcoming presidency. Uh, so Mike, we're looking forward to your talk on prevention of bile duct injury. Dr. Melinger, thank you very much. It's really a, a pleasure to be a part of this uh, SAGES uh, webinar. Uh, this is a topic that's uh, near and dear uh, to my heart. And um, I, I think that the SAGES resident webinars have been a great success over the last several years, thanks to your leadership and others on the Resident Education uh, Committee. Um, and uh, I hope that you will find this one uh, tonight uh, informative and may help uh, tip the needle a little bit in terms of uh, improving safe practices around cholecystectomy. So the, the topic that I've been charged with is prevention of bile duct injury. Uh, here is my uh, disclosure slide. Uh, I have no disclosures. Oh, I'll move the slide forward. Sorry. No disclosures uh, relevant to this uh, talk. I think there are a number of issues that are uh, of 
concern of the Coal Society in 2014. And although we're really not discussing this topic, I still feel the, the open coal cystectomy rate is probably a little bit higher than it should be, particularly for acute cholecystitis. As you all have acknowledged, serious complications continue to occur, and not just bile duct injuries, but also uh, GI perforations, duodenum and other uh, GI perforations related to access. I think there's a misunderstanding of the critical view of safety, so I don't think it hurts for us to touch on that a bit. And a low rate of use of geography and ability to interpret plan geography. So um, now, um, I trained in the era of open surgery, um, and uh, all of the cold cystectomies I did as a trainee were open. Um, and if you're Lyndon Johnson, shown here, showing off his uh, cold cystectomy scar to the White House press corps just a few days after this procedure, maybe that's not a big deal. But um, if you're Marilyn Monroe, on the other hand, it is a problem. Most of you probably don't realize she had an open cold cystectomy. Not a very good looking scar, and in fact you can see the drain scar that's just a little bit below and to the right of the cold cystectomy scar. <clears throat> and one of the, um, the really uh, sentinel events that helped propel this forward, at least from the SAGES perspective, was occurred at the SAGES meeting in Louisville, Kentucky in 1989. And it was a French surgeon, Jacques Parasat, that brought this video that he wanted to show to some of the SAGES members. And this was the first lap coli that was ever shown at a SAGES meeting. And it was immediately taken up by the SAGES membership. We have to learn this. We have to do it. Of course, there are others that were involved in the U.S., Eddie Joe Reddick, uh, and Doug Olson in Nashville, and several others that really helped propel this forward. Uh, and very quickly, laparoscopic colostectomy became uh, the new gold standard uh, for taking out the gallbladder, um, as stated in this publication from 1992 by Nat Soper and colleagues here at WashU. And for patients, it really was almost like a miracle. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't come from that era, uh, patients were in the hospital for three or four or five days. There were wound complications, et cetera, et cetera. And so there was a real race for surgeons to learn this. And these weekend courses uh, popped up, and we had a real challenge in general surgery that we never had to deal with before, and that is training or retraining an entire generation of surgeons in how to do laparoscopic surgery access and to take the gallbladder out. And there was a problem with that, and that was uh, the problem of bile duct injury. And there was a rash of biliary injuries that occurred shortly after the introduction of a cholecystectomy. This is uh, an early study that was published in the New England Journal in 1991 from the Southern Surgeons Club. Uh, it was a prospective study of over 1,500 patients who underwent laparoscopic cholecystectomy. The complication rate was 5%. But look at the bile duct injury rate. It was 2.2% in the first 13 patients operated on by each surgical group, and 0.1% for subsequent patients. Let's take a little bit at some more contemporary data. This is a study of over 1.1 million patient discharges related to cholecystectomy from the nation inpatient sample from 1998 to 2006. Some of the risk factors for increased complications you've heard about already, older age, because these patients tend to have more complicated gallstone disease, male gender, and uh, multiple comorbidities, as well as higher surgeon and hospital volume led to fewer complications. But the thing that's a bit concerning about this is if you look at the overall complication rate from 1998 on the left-hand side through 2006 on the right, it really hasn't changed. In fact, it's actually gone up a little bit. And so how can this be? And um, <clears throat> also in this study, if you look at the distribution of those complications, perforation and laceration, which is highlighted by the arrow, 0.5%. Now, they didn't delineate exactly what all those complications were, but I suspect the number were bile, uh, duct injuries, bile leaks, uh, and uh, perhaps uh, 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 intestinal injuries as well. And then this is a, um, another paper that was published in uh, JAX in 2008 from the NISQIP database. And it's about prioritizing quality improvement in general surgery. We're all, all about quality improvement today, right? Uh, they looked at, um, uh, they grouped uh, procedures uh, into 36 categories according to CPT code. And you can see that number one on the list is colectomy. But number three is cholecystectomy. And it's not because the complication rate is necessarily so high. 
but just the high volume of cholecystectomies done in the U.S. And so uh, I would argue that it is a public health concern for the population, not only in the U.S., but worldwide. So why have outcomes not improved more for cholecystectomy? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. Some may be patient factors. Uh, certainly the obesity epidemic may be a factor, and some have suggested higher illness acuity. But I can tell you, and I would imagine Dr. Strasberg will vouch for this, when I started in practice around 1990, the first three or four years, I did many more difficult gallbladders back then than I do now, and I think it's because patients are willing to come in and have their procedures done early rather than wait to advanced stages of disease. There may be an inherent increased risk of biliary injury with a laparoscopic approach. Uh, I think we would agree that there's a relatively low use of and probable expertise with clean geography. I think there's an incomplete understanding of the critical view of safety. There may be issues of inadequate training and experience. Uh, for the resident groups, uh, at what point during your training do you do most of your gallbladders? Probably in your junior and mid-level years and fewer in your senior years, just as about, you're about ready to go out into practice. And there may also be uh, fundamentally some flawed surgical techniques that are being done. Now, for elective lap coli, conversion rates are typically low. The major risk factor is if you see a thick gallbladder wall on preoperative ultrasound, especially if it's thick and contracted. And predictors of the difficult lap coli, Dr. Bittner has already talked about this, but I want to show you just a little bit of data about acute cholecystitis or a history of in two studies. This first was published in the World Journal of Surgery in 2008. It's a national hospital discharge sample over six years of one million cholecystectomies for acute cholecystitis. Look at the conversion rate, 9.5 percent, but 15 percent started as open coles, and open cole was associated with a higher morbidity rate. And then this second study, which is a prospective study of uh, over 1,000 patients with acute cholecystitis from 53 surgeons in Belgium. In, in Belgium. Um, 93 percent were started laparoscopically, another 11 percent were converted, so overall our open rate is close to 20 percent. And look at the incidence of biliary injury, 1.2 percent. But what is really concerning is if you break this down further, the patients who had a successful lap coli, bioduct injury, 0.4 percent, the number that was mentioned at the beginning of this webinar. But look at the rates in the laparoscopic cases converted to open. Bile duct injury rate, 6%. Biliary fistula, or that is bile duct, 7.7%. For a total biliary complication rate of almost 14%. That's really astounding. Now, four of those injuries occurred before, but three happened after conversion. And look in the open group, 2.7% rate of bile duct injury rate in the open group. So we have a lot of work to do in this population. This is one of most, the most common causes of litigation, and most of these are missed injuries, and the vast majority are, are either bile duct injuries or bowel injuries with a smattering of others. Okay. And there is substantial mortality that has been associated with those. So let's talk specifically about bile duct injury during lap coli, and I'll touch on some prevention strategies. Dr. Bittner mentioned cystic duct leaks, um, and uh, a major bile duct uh, injury, 0.2 to 0.4 percent for about 3,000 annually in the U.S. estimated. Now, cystic duct stump leaks can usually be managed conservatively, but they are not necessarily benign. This is one study of 12 such cases. The patients presented an average of 2.3 days after surgery. Five had quote-unquote abnormal cystic ducts. The most common presenting complaint was abdominal pain. Most of these could be treated with ERCP and stenting alone. Some also required CT drainage, but one patient died. So this is, I think, potentially a preventable complication um, and not necessarily benign. Um, risk factors for a cystic duct leak, or if you have a thickened cystic duct, that is going to be the difficult gallbladder. If there's distal obstruction, I did a case yesterday. We did the cholangiogram, and there were two stones in the duct, one of which was obstructed. And so that's the kind of patient that you better do something besides put a clip on the cystic duct and use the middle loop. Or if you've done a transcystic exploration for a bile duct stone, okay? So in those situations, I use a loop suture. Now, I would disagree somewhat with Dr. Bittner. I use a clip and then loop the cystic duct. So what I'll do is I'll uh, clip either side of the cystic duct very close to where I've done the cholangiogram so I have a stump of cystic duct I can work with and then cut it and then I put my loop 
but just below where that clip was applied. You have to be a little careful so it doesn't, um, the, the loop doesn't tie down across the, the clip that stays below it. But with, with practice, uh, this can be done reliably. And I think it's a good way to prevent these injuries. The other uh, mechanism for these leaks, I think, is getting a little bit too deep in the plane of the liver, taking the gallbladder off. And if there's any concern there, then you should certainly uh, leave the drain in. The question has been raised, is a bilic injury uh, an inherent risk of lap coli? Joe Fisher has raised that issue. Um, I don't know that it necessarily is. There are a variety of techniques that have been used, and I can tell you when I started in practice, I was doing something akin to the infundibular technique. Um, and it wasn't until 1995 that Dr. Strasberg reported the critical view technique. I had a couple of bile injuries in the early 1990s. And since I converted to using the critical view technique, I've not had a bile injury. This is the infundibular technique. You uh, identify a ductal structure, you follow it up to the gallbladder where it flares out onto the infundibulum, and, uh, and you should be there at that junction. But there is an inherent visual deception in this technique. Uh, and in cases in which you may have either advert anatomy or an inflammatory fusion of the neck of the gallbladder down to the bile duct, you think you're around the cystic duct when in reality it's the common bile duct. And so the, the infundibular technique will fail under difficult circumstances like an acutely inflamed gallbladder, an impacted stone in the neck, or a Marinci syndrome. If there's severe chronic inflammation of contracted gallbladder, impacted stone, uh, or if you've got an intrahepatic gallbladder or aberrant ducts, okay, so beware. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about the critical view of safety. You've already seen some pictures. Um, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been to uh, a meeting, seen a video or a picture, and a surgeon says, and we got the critical view, and I said, that's not the critical view. So let me ask the, the residents in the audience, do you think, is this the critical view of safety? The answer is no, it's not. You see two structures, there's a window there, but uh, you haven't completely dissected this out. And so the criteria are as defined by Dr. Strasberg uh, in this uh, landmark paper reported in JAX 1995. And I ask our residents this whenever they start doing these cases uh, with me to make sure they understand this. So first there should be uh, a clear hepatocystic triangle, should be cleared of all extraneous tissue. <coughs> The lower part of the gallbladder should be separated from the liver bed to the cystic plate, okay? And there should be two and only two structures entering the gallbladder. So here's what it should look like. Uh, clear hepatocystic triangle, two structures, and you can see, I forget where the pointer is, but um, it's, uh, you can see the gallbladder's all the way up to, off to the cystic plate there. And, and we want to see this view both from the anterior view on the left as well as the dorsal view or reverse callos view, okay? Now, I'll just show this a video clip, because sometimes it's illustrated much better on video. And how many of you noticed that right hepatic artery that's creeping up there on that dorsal lateral view where the cystic, duct, cystic artery is coming off? It's closer to where you're working back there than you think. And time and again, you see our residents starting to dissect in a little too much of a posterior plane and come perilously close to that right hepatic artery. Now, the uh, Dutch Society of Surgery was concerned about the problem of biliary injury such that they established a commission to look at this problem and develop the best practice guidelines for performing cholecystectomy. And they adopted the critical view as the standard method of ductal identification and have recommended that surgeons photo document the critical view prior to dividing the cystic duct. What I would add to this is this should probably, probably be an occasion for an intraoperative time out or stop. We think we have the critical view. Before we clip any structures, does everybody agree? Let's be sure that we're not fooling ourselves here. Okay? Well, what about plan geography? Let's review some of the facts. Uh, in a significant percent of cases in which there's been a biliary injury, abnormalities were misinterpreted. It should prevent higher injuries when interpreted correctly. In other words, if you cannulated the bile duct and you recognize it, then you shouldn't end up excising a portion of the duct up to the confluence of the right and left ducts, which is a much more severe injury. So it increases the chance of injury detection and therefore timely repair, but it may not identify aberrant ducts. You should be aware of some of the data in this literature. There's a number of pop there are a number of population-based studies uh, 
the one from the U.S. was David Flunschgut, Medicare Database Analysis, and about a 30% uh, uh, reduction in biliary injury when cholangiography was used. And another from Sweden of over 150,000 cholecystectomies, similar reduction in biliary injury rate. And then this recent study published in the British Medical Journal uh, of over 51,000 cholecystectomies in this Galrix Swedish database, 1.5% uh, iatrogenic bile duct injuries. That's a bit concerning. Mortality at a year if the patient had a bile duct injury was substantially higher than if they hadn't. And the incidence of bile duct injury was 29% lower if intraoperative cholangiography was used or attempted. Okay? And it reduced the death, risk of death by 62%. So we have data to support. Um, I, I think there are at least five reasons why uh, surgeons should do cholangiography, and particularly residents in training should do cholangiography. Number one, it's an essential and unique skill component of cholecystectomy. Just because you can take a gallbladder out doesn't mean you're skilled in doing a cholangiogram. And you need to be able to do it when it's clearly indicated. Um, it helps you learn how to accurately interpret the findings. It may help identify aberrant biliary anatomy. It's clearly a prerequisite to performing laparoscopic common bile duct exploration. And there's no reason that we can't uh, do more one-stage clearance of bile duct stones. But if you don't do cholangiography, you won't be able to do that. And then the fifth is related to reduction of biliary injury or reducing the severity of biliary injury. So I would encourage the residents and the audience to please go back to your attendings and push. If you're not doing cholangiography with some frequency, uh, to push them to do it. With skill and experience, in most cases, it takes five minutes or less to do it, quite honestly. Well, let me show you a cholangiogram. Take a look at this. How many of you think this is okay and you should proceed? Well, we spent a few minutes uh, in this particular patient. It was a difficult cholecystectomy. And I tried a number of maneuvers and couldn't get proximal filling and uh, was concerned. And eventually, we uh, gave the patient a little morphine and were able to reflux contrast, as you can see on the right, <coughs> up into the bile tree into the rest of the biliary tree. It doesn't project here real well, but it was a normal remainder of the bile duct. So you should never leave the operating room seeing filling only in the distal duct. What about this glandiogram? Look at the distal duct. You see stone there? It's not completely obstructing because there's contrast into the duodenum. But is the proximal ductal tree normal? The answer is no. Uh, this study was interpreted as showing a stone in the distal duct, which was present, but it missed a low-lying right hepatic duct that had been cannulated, and so there's a significant part of the liver being drained by that right hepatic duct that was totally missed in this case. So how to avoid misidentifying uh, and injuring the bile duct? I think, number one, dissect the critical view. Number two, perform cholangiogram and ideally combine both together. Now, these next two slides um, I uh, got from Steve Strasberg, who's uh, thought a lot about this uh, problem. And um, there are occasions in which um, it's very difficult to get the critical view. And while if you've got the critical view, you shouldn't injure the bile duct subsequently, it is possible to injure it trying to get to the critical view. And so, what, um, what he emphasizes, and which I wholeheartedly agree with, is that we have to un not only understand but convince ourselves that it's the right thing to do to stay out of this area, this inflammatory uh, uh, morass around the neck of the gallbladder and bile duct that occurs in some of these extremely difficult cases, and uh, to just simply stay out of this area when the normal anatomy is obscured, because a biliary injury in the setting of this is a real difficult thing uh, to, uh, to repair. Um, and it's in that situation that uh, we have a number of the options that Dr. Bittner talked about. Uh, Dr. Strasberg also makes the point that, remember, gallstone disease is a benign disease. You never have to complete a cholecystectomy. And the benefit of completing a cholecystectomy is minor compared to the benefit of avoiding a biliary injury. I think we have to take these lessons uh, to heart. Uh, when we're encountering situations like this. And you have options. Uh, you can put a tube in the gallbladder, drain it, get out. We've done that before in the setting of finding an unexpected cholecystoduodenal fistula. Uh, you can leave the neck of the gallbladder um, 
and uh, just uh, remove, do a subtotal cholecystectomy or even leave the back wall of the gallbladder, get all the stones out. Um, over so the distal end or simply drain it um, and avoid getting in there. And Dr. Strasberg um, recently published uh, this uh, link in, uh, in the Journal of American College. It's a teaching program for promoting culture of safety and cholecystectomy, avoiding bioelectric injury, a series of PowerPoint, narrated PowerPoint slides that has a lot of important uh, pearls and lessons in it, and I would strongly encourage you uh, to, uh, to take uh, some time and, uh, and go through that. And then finally, just a, a few, a word of caution about some of these newer approaches. Single incision, nodes, robotic, especially robotic single incision you combine two new technologies. Um, I think we have to be exceptionally careful about this. This is a, a different view. You're looking in line. It may be more challenging to get a critical view. And so I think the minimal gain that you get from a smaller incision or a single incision site uh, or doing it in a nose fashion uh, uh, just simply doesn't, uh, doesn't justify potentially the increased risk of having a bioelectric injury in, in a single patient. Finally, I would uh, refer you to this uh, editorial uh, by none other than George Bercy, uh, at the age of 91, helped who led and put this together uh, about laparoscopic cholecystectomy and the lessons of first, do no harm and avoid biliary injury, and second, we need to do more to take care of the bioelectric stones. It's been a pleasure uh, talking with you, and I look forward to the questions in the panel discussion. Thanks very much. Mike, thank you for a tremendous review and uh, a wealth of literature uh, that you've touched on for us. Um, Mike has another commitment later tonight, so I do want to make sure we allow at least a few minutes for some questions for him. Again, the audience can type those in uh, in the chat and area. I'll down to the end, John, to, to the best I can. So. Okay, wonderful. Well, um, one question I was going to ask you just while we wait, Mike, to see if others join in. You, you touched on an important challenge that all of us face if we do cholangiography, and that's the times that we can't get good proximal filling. And you briefly mentioned some maneuvers that you go through, and you, you talked about morphine and pharmacologic maneuvers. But could you just briefly run through um, for the participants uh, what your menu of things you do in that instance is before uh, you prove to yourself that you have to do something else to, uh, to be sure there isn't a common duct injury? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So uh, one of the first things you can do is put the patient in from Delbert position head down, and sometimes that will, uh, will get proximal filling. You have to make sure that your catheter is not in too far. Sometimes if you've threaded a catheter in too far and it's down in the, in the, in the distal bile duct, it can be hard, and the, and, the, and the sphincter's open and the bile duct empties rapidly, it can be hard to get proximal filling under those circumstances. Uh, another maneuver is you can put a, an atraumatic uh, uh, grasping or dissecting instrument in and try to compress distally to get the uh, flow proximally. Um, and I have given uh, morphine on occasion to make the sphincter go into spasm so that you can uh, make it contract so that you can uh, feel proximally. All of those things. If, if you don't see the proximal biliary tree despite all of those maneuvers, then I think you're, you're, you're probably obligated to uh, open the patient. One other question, Mike. Have you, um, in your experience, uh, had to uh, utilize transcystic cholangiography often, and in what circumstances do you entertain that? Uh, you mean uh, using uh, through the neck of the gallbladder? Correct. With, with one of those uh, uh, proprietary clamps like the Kumar flanger clamp. Uh, I've not done it uh, personally. Um, uh, I, have, I think with the experience, your success rate for cystic duct cholangiography should be in the 95 to 98 percent category. Um, and um, the problem with going through the gallbladder is uh, you may have occlusion of the cystic duct. It, take, it can take a while for the contrast to, uh, to uh, filter down, percolate down into the cystic duct, into the gallbladder, and, and you may not get really good filling of the uh, proximal biliary tree as well. But I personally don't have any experience. Other people have used that and, and like that approach, so it's certainly an option. Thank you very much. Well, we'll, we'll uh, have some time for further questions uh, when we get to the uh, Q&A at the end. Uh, and uh, it's my privilege now um, to introduce Steve Strasberg. You've heard Steve's name. Those of you that aren't uh, 
familiar with him and familiar with his work, you've heard him referenced already in every talk that's been given tonight. Uh, Steve is Pruitt Professor of Surgery at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, and he is also the Carl Moyer, Carl Moyer Departmental Teaching Coordinator there. Steve has uh, received the Lifetime Achievement Award, Gold Medallion of the International Hepatopancreatic Biliary Association. He has uh, either directly or from afar been a mentor to virtually all of us uh, involved in the panel tonight and uh, really uh, to many throughout the world, uh, as Mike has pointed out in his talk, in the area of uh, biliary surgery and especially pre preventing and appropriately managing biliary injuries. So we're privileged to have Steve be part of the panel tonight and he's going to talk about managing common duct injuries. Oh, Dr. Mellinger, uh, thank you very much uh, for that introduction and also for asking me to be involved in uh, this webinar. Um, uh, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about the rationale for uh, management uh, of biliary and uh, vascular biliary injuries. I'm not seeing a little box. I see. Okay, good. Right, good. Um, I, I start off by saying a lot of what I'm going to say is formulaic. It's really based on surgical experience and observational data. Because of that, it's really a recipe of how to manage bile duct injuries. And other ways of doing it might work just as well. The reason that I have to say that is it's really difficult to do high-level trials in such an uncommon sporadic problem. And also, at least in tertiary care centers, and I'll come back to that uh, in a few minutes, the, the uh, results uh, of treating common bile duct injuries or bile duct injuries are very, very good. So you need large numbers to test different methods. Now, these are the principles that I think are important. Uh, uh, there's three preoperative principles and uh, two intraoperative principles. And the preoperative principle, that's where I'm going to start, is are to diagnose completely the extent of the injury uh, in order to avoid missing uh, injured ducts and not repairing them and having a bad outcome. And also, uh, as I will explain, diagnosing vascular injuries because they're very important in directing how we should um, manage bile duct injuries. Uh, it's important to determine when the repair should be done because we want to avoid doing the repair when the operative conditions are very difficult. And uh, of course, preoperative preparation, we want to operate on the prepared patient. So when we diagnose a biliary injury, what are we trying to answer? We're, we want to know what the ex anatomical extent of the injury is. In other words, what's the type of injury? And very importantly, and this has come up more and more in recent years, we want to to know if there's also been a vascular injury. If so, which vessels are involved? And also, is there liver damage? Because some bile duct injuries are really hepatobiliary, not just biliary injuries, unfortunately. This is the classification that we use. Uh, some of you may be familiar with it. It's in some of the papers that have already been mentioned. Um, and it's essentially an anatomic um, uh, classification is based on bismuth classification of strictures, but it's adapted for the laparoscopic era. So sometimes uh, the diagnosis of biliary injury is made during an operation, either by seeing a divided bile duct uh, or after conversion for bleeding uh, or seeing bile in the field. That's the usual way that uh, people say, I think I've got uh, a bile duct injury. Um, and I think it's important um, to, uh, if you're a, a surgeon doing this kind of repair, to know what to say to the surgeon that calls you on the telephone and says, I think I've got a bile duct injury. And by the way, I think that if you are a surgeon, if you're a community surgeon practicing, I think that this gives you some idea of what you should or should not do if you think you have a bile duct injury. So if you really think you have a major bile duct injury, don't convert to an open procedure because unless you're really prepared to, to, to fix it yourself. And if this is an operation that you do occasionally, 
then don't do it at all because the results are much better if it's done by people uh, who do this operation frequently. Don't do any additional dissection uh, because that can raise the level of the injury. If the gallbladder is still in sight, you leave it alone. Place close, close suction drains. If there's an open duct then, and it's easy to do a cholangiogram into that open duct, do that because it helps guide the diagnosis later on and transfer the patient. Most injuries are diagnosed postoperatively, at least the major ones, and uh, they present in three ways, jaundice only, jaundice with sepsis, or uh, fistula. And uh, I've already said uh, points two and three, uh, the, the goals of postoperative, the goals in the, pre in the uh, time when the patient's referred to the tertiary center are to manage acute problems, mainly sepsis, and then do the two other things that are required for diagnosis, get the full extent of the biliary injury, and determine if there's a concomitant vascular injury. So when you have the jaundice-only situation, this means you're going to have a dilated biliary tree. Uh, you're going to be able to see it to do studies. If you have jaundice with sepsis, it almost always means there's a biloma, so the bile duct's going to be open. You're going to have a decompressed biliary tree and the same is usually true with fistula. Now, for, um, we, we tailor our studies based upon the, the presentation. If a patient presents with jaundice and they're feeling well, then we do an ERCP, and sometimes that's due to a stenosis, which can be corrected. If it's a complete obstruction, then a PTC will be done. And when the patient presents with sepsis and jaundice or without jaundice, then it's likely the patient will have a biloma, uh, and um, usually what we do is a CT and drain the bilomas and then do a delayed uh, percutaneous cholangiogram. And we'll, I'll explain that a little more because I think it's imp important. I think it's a very good method and a fistula, a fistula gram. Now somewhere along the line, uh, either with a CT or in some cases, some people prefer doing MRs, then um, you need to evaluate the vasculature. The MR, can sometimes do all of this, uh, and some people prefer starting with an MR to see if there's a vascular injury to see the extent of the biliary injury. But if the bile ducts are decompressed, an MR will often not give you the, de the degree of detail that you need to diagnose the injury completely. So let's come back to this commonest way that patients present with sepsis, pain, and jaundice and um, the, the biloma has been drained, and one wants to see the biliary tree to make the diagnosis. So here, we have waited two weeks postoperatively, and what we've done is a retrograde injection into decompressed ducts. Very hard to do a PTC to these decompressed ducts, but if you wait two weeks, the biloma contracts, and retrograde injection will go right up the bile duct. So here's an injury that will carry through some of this talk. This is what we call an E4 injury. It's above the confluence of the right and left ducts. And so we inject one drain, uh, subhepatic drain, and you can see the right duct, and then you can see the left duct also uh, in the same retrograde cholangiogram. And so the next question is, uh, when do you do the repair? Uh, there are certain questions which decide the timing of the repair. The first is, can the biliary injury be completely diagnosed early? If it's a complex injury, such as the one that I just showed you, it's probably not going to be diagnosed uh, overnight, uh, and it's likely that you'll do a delayed repair. Is there a vascular injury? I'll talk about that in a minute. And what is be the extent of the acute uh, inflammation? And that is related to the timing of referral and the type of injury, and how stable is the patient? So those are the four questions you want to ask in regard to when the injury should be repaired. So as you know, biliary injuries are commonly associated with uh, vascular injuries, especially right hepatic artery injuries. And the right hepatic artery runs uh, behind, usually, the common hepatic duct about a centimeter or two below the confluence. And in uh, injuries uh, in, published in the literature, right hepatic artery injuries, Although the mechanical level of the injury is a centimeter or two below the confluence, the actual level of the injury is uh, at the confluence. And um, the reason for that, oh, and I should also say, 
when one looks at the literature uh, and examines studies in which early repairs were done in the face of a right hepatic artery uh, injury, there's a high incidence of later ischemic strictures. And the reason for that is, shown in this slide, although the mechanical injury is at the level of the mid-common hepatic duct, the act, there is necrosis, or rather ischemia, of this portion of duct between the level of the injury, the mechanical injury, and the confluence. And if one does a repair in the early postoperative period to this part of the duct, it's actually an ischemic duct, then later ischemic strictures are more common. So uh, here's a summary of the timing uh, of repair in vascular barrier injuries. In the literature, anastomotic strictures are common after early repair of the bile duct injury in the presence of a vascular biliary injury, especially to the right hepatic artery. Anastomotic strictures are much less common after early repair when the vascular biliary injury is absent or after delayed repair even when the vascular biliary injury is present. That's because if you delay the repair, the bile duct will die back and it will be obvious that then that, that portion of duct, um, uh, which is ischemic, it will actually be gone. Uh, because it will involute over two or three months, and then the repair can be done to uh, well vascularized duct. Therefore, all major bile duct injuries should be evaluated for a vascular biliary injury, and repair should be delayed in those with a right hepatic vascular biliary injury, unless you intend to redo the repair very high. Now, this shows um, uh, the timing uh, in relation to inflammation. Um, this is a, an approximation. If the patient's referred within uh, uh, seven days, then probably there's not going to be uh, that great uh, uh, vascular inflammation. But, and after three months, uh, that will also be gone. But in this interim period, seven to 10 days after the injury and up to three months, that's not a, a very opportune time to do a big operation in the right upper quadrant. So early repair is performed. If the bile duct injury can be completely diagnosed, if there's not a concomitant vascular injury, the timing of referrals outside the period of intense inflammation, and the patient is stable. So what do we do if the patient has a complex injury or a vascular biliary injury? Well, when we do the retrograde cholangiogram, then a tube is placed in the bile duct, uh, and, a, and it's brought through, it's, it's, it's captured, by coming up the biloma drain, and a U-tube is left in place for three months. A U-tube is a very good way of doing this because it's totally stable, it never falls out. Now notice we don't put two tubes in here at this point because the other side in this E4 injury will simply drain into the residual biloma cavity and come out the same tube. And of course, one uses general supportive measures, fluid electrolytes and vitamin K. Now, Immediately before surgery, um, we get an anesthesia consult um, and do the preoperative testing. And the day before surgery, we will put uh, a tube in all isolated ducts. In other words, in this particular case, there are two isolated segments of the biliary tree. So the day before surgery, this gets a tube. The reason for that is it's much easier to find these ducts when you can palpate a tube in them. And you need a good interventional radiology group to do this successfully. We also do a conciliation between the cholangiogram and the CT. The ducts that we have have to fit the liver so that we don't miss uh, ducts that need repair. So now let's turn to the second portion, to the intraoperative uh, principles. They are to locate all the ducts at the time of repair and to do a meticulous biliary enteric anastomotic technique with side-to-side -side anastomosis when possible, and I'll explain that to you. Uh, the principles uh, are, of course, to identify all the injured bile ducts and then to perform an hepatical jejunostomy. The hepatical jejunostomy should be mucosa to mucosa, good blood supply, no tension. That's why we use a long rule limb so there's no tension, adequate size of openings, and fine absorbable sutures. 
we do a site-to-site -site anastomosis whenever possible because a site-to-site -site anastomosis helps fulfill having a good blood supply because you do not need to mobilize the bile duct circumferentially, which can rob it of its blood supply, and it gives good uh, opening. Now, hepaticojejunostomy is preferred to hepaticoduodenostomy, although sometimes this operation um, is a, a hepaticoduodenostomy is reasonable, but uh, and or to a colidoco colidocostomy. Uh, hepaticojejunostomy has no problem with blood supply or tension, whereas the duodeno operation does have a potential problem with tension, and the colidoco colidocostomy has a potential problem with blood supply. At any rate, a roux loop formation should be a routine 20-minute procedure for surgeons that are doing this all the time. Other tips of good repair are magnifying loops, and we don't use stents unless the ducts are extremely small, uh, two millimeters or less. That is, sometimes one has three or four ducts, and some of them can be extremely small, and those are stented. So this shows some examples for the different levels. If we have uh, an early referral, with an E1 or E2 injury, we cut off uh, the duct about one centimeter below the confluence, because usually this area is ischemic. And we don't do an end to a side repair. We do a side to side repair uh, for the reasons I've already told you. And an incision is made in the bile duct to do so. Sometimes it goes up the right side. Often we'll even close the bottom end of the duct so that's truly entirely side to side repair to have the best blood supply. If it's a chronic, chronic case, then we'll open the, the lower end. The, we'll, we'll open the uh, lower end of the common hepatic duct where the stricture is, and trace it up and divide it. Uh, open it. Uh, open the left hepatic duct and the right hepatic duct to create this cloacal opening. Now, when you have a higher injury, uh, such as this E3 injury, you can. Um, decompress the entire biliary tree, drain the whole biliary tree through the left hepatic duct, which runs in an extra hepatic course. And of course, this was the famous Hepquino paper. If, you, if you're, um, I would recommend this to all residents. It's one of the most classic papers in biliary surgery, uh, explaining how the, how the left hepatic duct runs in an extra hepatic position, and the hilar plate can be lowered the duct can be open and a good side-to-side -side anastomosis can be done. And this shows the left hepatic duct uh, opened and ready to receive the jejunum. The anterior row of sutures have already been placed. Sometimes the left hepatic duct is horizontal, but sometimes it's vertical and a little harder to get at. That's shown in the inset. Now, you can have more complex injuries than the E3 injuries. There, some of these injuries uh, you can drain the left side of the biliary tree, with uh, the E4 and the E5, which shown in green. You can drain the left side with a hepquino repair, but you cannot uh, drain the uh, right side. And the right side has to be drained separately, uh, as in B or C injuries, in which only the right side has to be drained. And in, 19, in 2001, rather, uh, we showed this technique. Uh, for getting at those uh, isolated right ducts. And how this is done is in four steps, and it's based upon the fact that the left and the right ducts lie in the same coronal plane, and that the cystic plate inserts into the sheath of the right portal pedicle. And here, um, uh, in step one, you do the Hefquino approach to find the left hepatic duct, then stay in the same coronal plane, divide the gallbladder plate, and then uh, the right portal pedicle can be displayed. Uh, and if you have a tube in it, it makes it even easier. And then the, uh, le the right bile duct can be opened for a side-to-side -side anastomosis. And this shows um, a uh, E4 repair. We have tubes in the two tubes that I showed you before. The bile duct has been, have, have been slit on their anterior surfaces and the hepaticojejunostomy is done, and this is the post-operative picture of uh, the, two, uh, the two bile ducts sutured to the same loop of jejunum and a double-barreled anastomosis. Just a couple of words about vasculobiliary injuries. Should the right hepatic artery be repaired, one could have a symposium on vasculobiliary injuries, but the question, since this is about repair, should it be repaired? 
The repair has to be done within 24 hours, so the opportunity for repair is limited. The repair is often impossible because there's no good outflow vessels to the liver that remain. And actually, if you tie the right hepatic artery, only 10% of patients will develop relevant ischemia. So the conclusion is that repair of a right hepatic artery injury should only be done under ideal conditions. Just a word about liver resection in right, hepato, uh, right hepatic artery vascular failure injury. As I said, about 10% of patients with right hepatic artery vascular failure injury will develop a slow hepatic infarction. And these appear as abscesses, but they're really infarcted areas of liver. Some of these patients can be managed conservatively. A very few will become ill and require hemihepatectomy within days or weeks. This is unlike what we call extreme vascular biliary injuries in which the uh, portal vein is also injured. These people almost always require major liver resection. Uh, a few patients will require delayed resection due to the development of intrahepatic strictures and cholangitis. Uh, for, uh, this is a paper we published in 2009 on the results of side-to-side, -side, uh, policy of side-to-side -side anastomosis and delayed repair when it was indicated. It was published in Annals of Surgery. There's also results of many other case series uh, if you're uh, interested in reading a little more about the, this literature repair. Thank you very much. Hi, Steve. Are, are you finished? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just lost the audio for just a moment there. Outstanding talk. We had a, a question uh, from one of the participants about uh, vascular studies and what your recommendations were. I think in one of your early slides you outlined that CTA or MR angiography was your preference. And I think the question was whether uh, uh, direct angiography or other tools or ever things you need in special circumstances? I don't think it's hardly ever necessary to do anything, to do a direct angiogram anymore for this purpose. Uh, it, the only reason for doing a direct angiogram would be for therapeutic reasons. For instance, sometimes uh, when a patient comes and they, they have a, a CT angio or an MR angio, uh, one sees that there's a pseudoaneurysm that is developed in one of the arteries, and, and if there's a pseudoaneurysm, then something needs to be done about that therapeutically, and one would do uh, uh, an arteriogram uh, as we used to do diagnostically, but we only do now therapeutically. Very good. And are there any uh, nuances that, that the particip participants should think of if they're dealing with a situation such as some of those you've outlined in a patient with uh, cirrhosis or uh, other diseases affecting portal venous blood flow, any special nuances there they should be thoughtful about? Well, as, as we all know, and it was on one of the slides that Mike showed, I think, that cirrhosis uh, uh, is, associate, is associated with increased difficulty. I think also it was on one of Dr. Bittner's slides slides. We have to be very, very careful in doing um, cholecystectomies and cirrhotics, not so much because of biliary injuries, but because of the risk of bleeding, uh, uncontrolled bleeding. Uh, so uh, I think that's the main point there. The other point for the residents that I think I would make, and this relates back to the other speakers also, and that is litigation. Um, the, there's many papers in the literature which now show that repairs done uh, in community hospitals by people who aren't doing a lot of major liver biliary surgery have much worse outcome than repairs that are done uh, in tertiary care centers. And also, the risk of, of um, having a problem in terms of litigation goes way up if you do the repair yourself and it doesn't work. So that's a uh, thought to take away for um, the residents. Words of wisdom, and I think that you highlighted that uh, so many times uh, the default setting for those of us that are less experienced is to do what looks simple, uh, and often that leads people, I think, into attempts at direct duct repair or uh, duodenal uh, ostomy type reconstructions. 
And uh, as you pointed out, while, while those may lend themselves in some special situations, uh, the people of experience such as yourself have, I think, taught us all that um, the tension-free and well-vascularized options that the Rue Loop provides are, are superior. So thanks for, thanks for a fantastic summary and uh, for uh, offering your experience and wealth of experience on this to the group tonight. I'm going to move us on to the last talk, and then we'll bring the whole panel back um, for about the last 15 minutes. Uh, so for the participants, please be thinking of questions that you would like to pose uh, while Dr. Phillips is giving her talk here. I will uh, try to keep track of those and make sure we relay them uh, to the speakers as part of the panel discussion we'll finish with. So we're going to finish the last presentation now. Um, will be from Melissa Phillips. Uh, Melissa is Assistant Professor of Surgery at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Uh, and Melissa uh, did a fellowship uh, at Case uh, Medical Center with uh, Jeff Ponsky and Jeff Marks, who many of the speakers, all the speakers know uh, well. And uh, she has some real expertise based on that background and her experience since with ERCP. And I've asked uh, Melissa to address the issue for us of how ERCP uh, can play into uh, these issues with difficult gallbladders and bile duct injuries in select settings, and she's going to enlighten us on that tonight. Melissa? Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Mellinger, for the chance to come and talk to everybody today about ERCPs. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different perspective as the surgical endoscopist in the group, um, although I definitely echo a lot of the things that have been said on how to prevent them, and I think definitely prevention is one of the best things that we can do rather than having to have all of these tricks in our armamentarium for being able to treat the leaks and the strictures and the complications once we get into them. But I think, unfortunately, as every gray-haired surgeon knows, if you do enough of these cases, at some point in time, the anatomy will indeed fool you, and knowing how to get out of those um, tight binds is an important thing. Um, and I think endoscopy does give us an option um, in addition to what surgical endeavors we have for, for doing that. Um, I've got no specific disclosures related to this talk today to disclose to the group. Um, the objectives of my talk, I want to start first with some of the historical aspects of surgical endoscopy because I think that has definitely led to uh, the, um, evolve, the evolving nature of a standard of care for common bile duct disease. Many things that we used to treat surgically, we can now treat endoscopically. Um, and to kind of show the impact of these technologic advances on the common bile duct management, and then show you what I think has become the standard of care for the management of common bile duct disease. So for the uh, participants in the group, I would expect that everybody's seen a slide like this before, of which endoscopic technique was first described by a surgeon. Um, and as you can imagine, the correct answer to that would be all of them. So ERCP was first described in 1968 when William McCune wrote about his cannulation of the ampulla of water. Um, back in the 1960s and 1970s, when this was all starting out, there was about a 50% successful cannulation rate of the common bile duct. Um, and as the history and the technologic advancements have developed, we're now definitely in the greater than 90% category and have learned many more therapies. Um, the therapies were first described in the decade of the 70s and early 80s. Um, as this time, excuse me, at this time, the endoscopic sphincterotomy allowed um, additional access to the common bile duct and gave us the opportunity to perform many of the therapeutic things that I'll show you on some of the slides coming up. Um, and it really facilitated our ability to remove stones from the common bile duct and to be able to place biliary stents, which led to the decompression and thus management of bile leaks. When you look at a duodenoscope in the GI lab, it's very similar in its appearance to a colonoscope or a gastroscope. Um, but one of the things that you're going to notice that's slightly different is that it's a side viewing device rather than a forward viewing scope. And this allows the duodenoscope to be passed under manual insertion rather than direct visualization. But also allows the side visualization of that portion of the duodenum to clearly identify the ampulla and set up all of the standard Seldinger technique maneuvers for being able to get the instrumentation and therapeutic components into that common bile duct. 
Um, also separate from what is classic in the colonoscope and the gastroscope, there is a third dial called an elevator on the duodenum scope that gives you an up and down freedom um, for being able to successfully cannulate. And again, as compared to the 1970s where there was a 50-50 chance of being able to cannulate the common bile duct, our current cannulation rates run in the 92 to 94 percent depending on what series you're looking at. The indications for ERCP have also evolved with time. Um, again, in the earlier uses of the ERCP before things such as MRCP, MRA were available and commonly used, this was commonly performed for diagnostic procedures. Um, I think as the evolution of our non-invasive imaging has uh, developed over time, we're using ERCP now for more of a therapeutic or a confirmatory test with the option of therapeutic. Um, and a lot of the time, your patients are going to have an MRI, a HIDA scan, or an ultrasound that will give you a at least very good guess as to what's going on before you get to the point of ERCP to be able to confirm this finding and then make your desired intervention. Um, ERCP is safe and effective for clearing stones from the common bile duct. It's good for palliating a biliary obstruction, such as a non-resectable uh, pancreatic cancer. Um, it also treats common bile duct strictures, which could be benign or malignant in nature. And again, it aids in healing biliary leaks by providing uh, pressure equilibration and thus distal decompression of the duct. I think one of the most important things, and you've seen a number of IOCs today, um, is to be able to recognize normal anatomy. So um, one of the important things that I wanted to start with on this picture of the ERCP was the fact that this was a relatively normal cholangiogram. The only significant finding on this is the presence of cholelithiasis, which you can see in the distal aspect of the cystic duct and as the dye transitioned into the gallbladder. The remainder of the common bile duct, the bifurcations, the visualized pancreatic duct, the tapering down at the level of the ampulla, those are all normal findings. And it's important to know, as we've sort of talked about, what normal looks like before you go ahead and start talking about the pathology. In contrast to the last, you can clearly see that this ERCP is showing a biliary stricture. Um, this biliary structure happens to be at the takeoff of the cystic duct. As you can see, the small metal clip in the upper portion of the uh, finding there. Um, and this would be a post-surgical complication with a structure of the common bile duct. Additionally, you can diagnose biliary leaks. Uh, on the left, you've got a cystic duct leak, which is a you know, common occurrence at that 0.5 to 1% after routine laparoscopic cholecystectomy. Uh, we've also got on the right a uh, clearly visualized uh, intrahepatic leak, um, which would not be as typical after cholecystectomy, um, but would be uh, seen after other surgical interventions or as a complication of ERCP, such as a wire perforation of that intrahepatic duct. And Steve, I'm sorry to do this, but my screen has gone completely black and I've lost the ability to advance my slides now. Sorry guys, I'm not sure what's going on with the lack of advancement. Hey Melissa, it's Steve. Which slide are you on? Number 10. Excuse me. I see you advance. Are you advancing them now? Um, I have a completely black screen of death, unfortunately. Oh, now it's kicked back on. Wonderful. Sorry about that. I don't know exactly what happened. Um, the basic steps of an ERCP, as you can see on this slide, begin with cannulation of the ampulla of water. This gets you access to the common bile duct as well as the pancreatic duct and lets you perform the cholangiogram that you're all used to seeing as part of your standard laparoscopic cholecystectomy IOC. Again, many times you've had an MRCP and or an interactive cholangiogram and to set your expectations about what pathology you're planning to find. Um, this can be something such as a common bile duct stone. This can be something such as a biliary bile leak, for example, if you see a large biloma with extravasation of contrast on your HIDA scan. 
once you confirm your pathology, then it's time to consider the options for treatment. And I'm going to go through these in a little bit more detail than what's on this slide. But the basic principle of a bile leak is to provide distal decompression to facilitate drainage into the duodenum. The stent does not have to be placed over the area of the bile duct injury causing the leak, um, but is more designed to facilitate the path of leak. In terms of obstruction, there are definitely tricks for either um, removing an obstructing lesion, such as removal of a stone, or dilating and stenting in the setting of an unresectable stricture. The way many of these procedures start is an endoscopic biliary sphincterotomy. And I know quite often people have heard of the surgical sphincterotomy in a um, upper right picture the sphincter of the that's connected to an electric water um, in a standard pull technique, this wire can be used to open with electrocautery transfer of energy, the sphincter of Rivodi. And what this does is it allows for the larger working instruments to be introduced into the common bile duct for therapy. Quite often as you're performing the sphincterotomy, you will see the delivery or development of multiple small stones. Anything less than three to four millimeters will pass often at this point in time without therapy and decompression of the duct with return of bile at this point in time. If the look at the setting for common bile duct stone is known or suspected, the sphincterotomy is often required to be able to deliver the stone from the common bile duct into the duodenum. The most common technique is located in the lower picture, which is a balloon biliary extraction. The balloon is inserted into the common bile duct, blown up, and then used to sweep the stone Other techniques that are allowed for this are also a basket removal, which is pictured in the right upper corner, or a mechanical lithotripsy, um, as you've probably heard of used for uh, reasons, um, where the stone is actually crushed before delivering larger stones. Um, additionally, if you're unable to clear the stone through one of these techniques, one option that you have is to place a plastic biliary stent into the common bile duct and basically reroute the direction of biliary drainage. Often this allows the stone to soften. And thus, on a repeat ERCP performed four to six weeks later, that stone can usually be extracted. When you're looking at ERCPs for bile leaks, and again, you've seen this diagram in Dr. Strasburg's talk earlier today, um, the ERCP can help lead to the resolution leak in greater than 95% of patients. Um, again, the location of the injury often dictates the resolution, and you have improved outcomes with ductive luchta leaks and cystic duct stump leaks, which are the more common indications rather than a significant biliary injury. When looking at ERCP for biliary stricture, again, this gives you a clear identification of the area involved and details the degree of stricture and may indeed locate multiple strictures over time, specifically if that stricture comes from a concomitant vascular injury and is a result of ischemia. The stricture area can initially be dilated in the picture dilating balloons on this given example of how these work. Um, and then often the biliary stent is required. Um, as compared to a single surgical intervention, repeat ERCP may be required with replacement and upsizing of the biliary stent to get a successful result in this, uh, from these strictures. Um, significant strictures can often be temporized with a endoscopic approach, but may still require a surgical intervention for a more definitive therapy. When looking at the types of biliary stents that are available, um, the plastic biliary stent um, is the most common, um, and it is usually placed in a transampulary position. Uh, it provides support of a dilated area uh, as that stricture heals and recovers. The self-expandable metal and plastic stents have both been designed for malignant obstructions, um, and the self-expandable metal stent is often used off-label um, in the setting of strictures and bile leaks for non-malignant um, things. But again, this is a, a clear off-label indication for this stent. Um, the plastic biliary stent, as you can see here in the transampulary position, is great for the management of a bile leak and for bypassing those common duct stones that are hard or difficult to get out. You can see it on your standard x-ray imaging of the abdomen, clearly located near the clips from the cholecystectomy uh, and providing decompression of the common duct.
Steve, I'm afraid I've lost my editing stuff again. I'm sorry for that. There it goes. Thank you. Um, again, this is an example of the self-expanding metal stent, and this is an unresectable uh, pancreatic lesion um, that's being treated in this setting. The self-expanding metal stents provide a larger diameter on the order of 8 millimeters in size compared to a 4 French, which is you know 2 to 3 millimeters, um, and are more permanent in terms of being able to resist the ingrowth from the malignancy, which is why they're often used in that setting. In terms of the overall appearance of an ERCP, this is a generally safe procedure. Um, as with any other endoscopy, you do run a risk for desaturation, for medication reaction, and for perforation of the endoscope, which is, again, in the less than 0.1% category. Specifically looking at ERCP, bleeding is the most common after an endoscopic sphincterotomy where you're cutting through the muscle and there are certain techniques to prevent this, such as leaving the transverse fold and the blood supply of the duodenum intact at that point and not doing a super extensive sphincterotomy. Um, other things that are important to mention, um, infection, specifically ascending cholangitis on uh, strictures and obstructions that you're able to cannulate but not completely decompress, and this is something that you've got to be particularly diligent about in those patients in whom you're able to identify an obstruction but not able to treat that. Pancreatitis, again, is another known complication. Um, it is increased in many situations, including younger age, female sex, difficult cannulation, risk for periancillary diverticuli, um, and also the uh, um, performance of a endoscopic sphincterotomy. Retroperitoneal and duodenal perforation are quite, quite rare, and again, the mortality of this procedure uh, low compared to many other interventions. So important to know in the list of things that you may have as an endoscopic option for the treatment of common bile duct injuries and stones, um, it's a safe and effective option, and it is a good thing to have in your armamentarium as you're looking at postcholecystectomy com complications. Um, to help you take the best care of your patient. I'd be happy to open it up for questions from the audience. Wonderful, Melissa. Thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, one question uh, related to uh, your comment on using self-expanding stents. And uh, uh, I think uh, all of us that have had some experience with those find that even though um, the fully covered uh, terminology makes us feel that they're meant to, to be securely removable, if they stay in for three or four months, there's some overgrowth into the barbs at the ends can make changes challenging. If you use those um, for strictures, do you have a protocol that you follow in changing those stents? Um. They can definitely stay in place longer than the plastic stent. So the plastic stent, my protocol is usually a replacement every four to six weeks with a repeat dilation as needed. I try not to put in the self-expandable metal stents for strictures with the exception of my post-liver transplant population. Um, and that is because I think that the post-transplant population definitely has an immune-mediated response to the stricture that's present. Um, in those patients, um, we tend to monitor their labs and any elevation in their liver function enzymes is my indication to go back, but I tend to try and push that a little bit longer um, between repeat ERCPs up to the three to four month category, presuming that their labs are staying stable. Um, as you mentioned, the ingrowth around the barbs can be treated by placing a stent inside a stent. There's something about the um, increase in the radial force of doing that that allows that ingrowth to release gradually um, over a period of weeks, but the negative about that is it does require a second intervention. But if I do feel like it's stuck too tightly or that I'm going to cause injury by pulling out sort of that inner lining of the bile duct, um, that's definitely something that I use to, to help loosen up that ingrowth. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. And let me uh, just thank all the speakers for staying on time. They did a fantastic job not only of covering their material, but of staying within the time limits of the pace of the webinar. So I really want to express our, all of our gratitude for that. Um, we're going to pull everybody up, I think, now, and uh, hopefully have time for a panel discussion. I, again, would encourage uh, the participants 
to join in with questions, and we'll try to uh, keep track of those and relay them to the appropriate uh, panelists as they come in. Um, one question that I was going to ask uh, are both uh, Melissa and Dr. Phillips and Dr. Strasberg to comment on. Uh, both of them alluded to uh, the fact that uh, the technique they described um, has to be uh, looked at in a complementary way with other techniques. Uh, and in Dr. Phillips' talk, alluding to the fact that there are some strictures that need to be managed surgically, uh, and in Dr. Strasberg's, that there were some that might be amenable to endoscopic management. And I just thought it might be helpful to have each of them comment on what are the cases that they might get referred for their expertise that they would say, uh, I would send this one in the other direction. So Dr. Phillips, maybe you can go first. You get a call uh, to do some endoscopic uh, therapy for a stricture or a leak. And uh, what are the things that would make you say, I need to call Dr. Strasberg? And then we'll have Dr. Strasberg uh, uh, perhaps comment on what ones he might say. Let's give, a, let's give a trial of this endoscopically before we quit, commit to a surgical strategy. Dr. Phillips, why don't you go first? Full disclosure, my phone just cut out on that part, so I had to hang up and call back in. But I think you were asking what it is about the stricture or the leak that would lead me to start endoscopically as compared to start with a surgical intervention. Yeah, and perhaps comment on what situations you might get called about that you would quickly steer towards surgery instead of endoscopy. Absolutely. So I think endoscopy does a great job if there is an, a partial thickness injury um, or a small tear. So the idea of a cystic duct stump leak with a small opening, something like that can very easily heal spontaneously and is very amenable to an endoscopic drainage. Same idea on a small duct of Lushka leak. The larger transections, particularly the transections where the more proximal duct is, duct is not in continuity with the distal duct, are almost impossible from an endoscopic management perspective. I have been in on one case where there was a magical wire that was guided against completely across a completely transected right hepatic, and it managed to find its way into the right hepatic in the liver with a complete transection. I think the probability of doing that ever again in the future as I was watching that case is slim to none. So that would definitely be one of the indications if we think there's a complete transection um, that would be difficult endoscopically to be able to manage. Now that could be temporized endoscopically by putting a distal stent, placing a um, percutaneous drain into the bioloma, creating an external fistula tract, and then going back for a complete revision in terms of a surgical correction. But that wouldn't be a definitive treatment. That would only be a temporization. Very good. And, and Dr. Strasberg, if, if uh, you're still on, uh, there you are, could you uh, just briefly comment uh, from your perspective as somebody that manages many of the injuries and complex injuries surgically, what, what cases might you be referred that you would encourage an attempted endoscopic therapy before you'd commit to a surgical management strategy? Thank you, Dr. Mellinger. Well, first, I'd like to say that bile duct injuries require a team and people to look after them. They require endoscopists, interventional radiologists, and surgeons. We all need to work together to get the best result. Basically, we'll try to dilate uh, and stent strictures. Uh, of course, if there's complete disruption and separation at the ends of the bile duct, as Dr. Phillips just said, uh, uh, it has to be repaired. Surgically, but we'll 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 try to uh, stent uh, strictures. The, the the things which favor a good result from stenting are uh, late strictures as opposed to early ones, short strictures uh, as opposed to long ones, and strictures that don't involve a confluence or multiple ducts, and finally strictures that are not associated with an active fistula. So if you, have, if you don't have any of those bad things, then if it's, uh, it's very likely that um, ERCP is going to be able to deal with the structure. Thank you. Dr. Bittner, you had a question uh, I saw pop up on the chat uh, for Dr. Strasberg as well about uh, vascular injuries and pseudoaneurysms. Do you want to just share that? Sure, I was going to ask him. Um, 
you know, besides how frequently, if at all, he's able to repair those vascular injuries within 24 hours, giving the large referral base that he gets and the distance they may come, um, specifically related to those vascular biliary injuries, how does the how does the use of a or how does the presence of a pseudoaneurysm change your management overall? <clears throat> if there's a pseudoaneurysm, that has to be dealt with because, of course, you can that can result in massive bleeding. Um, the, the, we sometimes see pseudoaneurysms of the cystic artery, and these people present with hematobilia, uh, and that's usually treated by just uh, embolizing the cystic artery. Uh, if it's a different artery, then one has to determine what that artery is supplying and what the, what the risks are. Stenting um, is obviously the best way to approach that, but sometimes stenting is not possible. And then if you're going to embolize a major artery to a liver, you have to realize what the consequences of that to the liver and the bile duct might be. Sometimes you have no choice and have to try to do that. But um, the, the, the other question, Dr. Bittner, that you asked is, is about repairing arteries. So I, I don't really think that repairing the right hepatic artery injury is, uh, is a good idea. Because uh, a right hepatic artery injury only leads to liver ischemia in about one out of 10 cases. So you're, you're, one would be doing 10 of these operations to prevent ischemia to one patient's liver. And in the literature, uh, there are not a lot of cases of this actually having been done, probably fewer than 10 in the literature. So there's a lot of talk about it, but probably it's not necessary to do or a good idea to do. That is a right hepatic artery, or right hepatic artery injury. When you start getting into injuries to the portal vein and to the proper hepatic artery, that's a different thing because the liver will infarct, and if you can save that patient's liver, by repairing the artery or the vein, that's a good idea. Thank you. There was a question in, uh, uh, earlier from one of the residents participating tonight, uh, and they asked uh, the panelists uh, if there were uh, specific concerns about laparoscopic cholecystectomy and safety associated with the training environment. And since all of our panelists uh, work with residents and or fellows, um, that might be a good question to just have each, uh, each of you give a brief response to. Um, maybe, Dr. Bidner, why don't we start with you and then Dr. Phillips, run if he's still able to be with us. Um, talk about how you frame the training experience for your residents with regard to the culture of safety and preparation to do this operation uh, consistently and, and without uh, injuries or injuries minimized? Well, I'll state my bias right up front and having trained under yourself and Dr. Brunt um, uh, and so forth, I am a routine IOC user. So uh, with that bias, um, I do a routine one at my institution that and as Dr. Brown trying to get more and more of those surgeons here who do lap coli to do it routinely in an effort to teach our residents. Um, so I, I, I make it a mandatory part of their, of their training and their experience during lap coli and we use simulation to that end um, as well as intraoperative teaching. Um, so so I'm, I'm a big proponent of it um, uh, as well as not only performing it but assessing their performance of it postoperatively, and then reviewing those images with them and or the radiologist as needed um, to try to get them a full instruction in IOC and, and the importance of doing it routinely. Thank you. Dr. Phillips, any special tricks for the training environment that you would espouse? Um, I agree with Dr. Bidner. I am also a routine IOC person. And I think that on the side of the people who either do them and they're positive and or the ones that don't do them and you probably needed to have done them. Um, in terms of my technique for in the operating room, 
I have sort of a stepwise progression that all of the residents go through with me in terms of the degree of responsibility. They have to prove proficiency at this level before they're able to go on to the next step, and it gives them varying degrees of independence in the operating room. I also tend to give them a little bit of a time limit so that there's not a lot of flailing and undirected work. So when they're doing the dissection, they know where they're supposed to be. They're confident about what they're doing. And I think being able to teach, again, the more straightforward gallbladders um, earlier on, important thing, but kind of as was alluded to in the talks earlier, a gallbladder can end up being definitely a chief level and or a dual level attending case. Um, and often it is thought about as being something that every intern should be able to do. Um, so I think teaching them how to recognize the steps where the gallbladder is not as predictable, where you have the case where you bring the right hepatic artery up and you have to dissect it back down separately, the cases where you're a little low on the common duct and you see it and skeletonize it, I think those are the important things to sort of teach them the, the aberrancies as compared to the everything works. Dr. Strasburg, would you make your your many of us have learned uh, for the injuries, uh, the pattern of the injuries um, highlights for us the importance of thermal and vascular injuries as special subsets. And would you just comment on how you coach your residents or your fellows on uh, cautery uh, or thermal energy, especially in the early part of the dissection? Right, thank you. I, I think one really, just to make one really small point, I, I think it's really important to teach residents and show them that when you have a problem, a difficult operation, not only this operation, but any operation, that you're ready to call a colleague in to ask their opinion and their help. In, re, in regard to thermal injuries, I think that, and Mike's written a good deal about this too, I think the, the idea is to use the low power settings to pick up small pieces of tissue and to be sure that that tissue is not in contact with anything underneath it or beside it so that when uh, you, you are using uh, cautery that you don't injure structures. Also, um, we, we should teach residents how the cautery spreads in the body and the fact that if you're burning on a small piece of tissue and uh, that, that if, if that's next to something that's very important, uh, the, the uh, cautery can track down and burn a hole in something that's uh, a centimeter away, such as a common bile duct. Um, so certainly that's uh, all of those techniques are in regard to safety and the use of cautery are very important. Thank you. Mike, are you still in on the call as well? Still here. I'm sorry. It looks like our webcam is not working, but uh, Dr. Strasburg and I are both here. Wonderful. Any any comments you would make? You put a tremendous amount of thought into training and safety issues related to this operation. Uh, any any coaching you would provide uh, our resident listeners and also uh, faculty, including ourselves, that are listening on how to how to teach this optimally. Well, John, I could talk about this well into the night, but I'll try to keep it short. I, I think it starts with we have to. Uh, we have to emphasize safe access techniques because we're often challenged whether it's an obese patient or patient's had prior laparotomy or has an ostomy or has uh, had a ventral hernia repair with mesh. I mean, we can do with appropriate access, we can do it safely with a minimal risk of bowel injury and, and still do these operations knowing basic. I think, um, secondly, we have to understand where some of the greatest uh, potential of, of risk areas are for injury. Uh, the duodenum. I think we don't pay enough attention to doing that. And I still hear about duodenal injuries. And a duodenal injury is almost as bad, if not worse, than a bile duct injury sometimes. Um, the, the safe use of electrosurgery. How many times have you seen a resident look away with the tip of the uh, L-hook uh, bogey inside the abdomen, look away to the foot pedal, and have no idea where that tip is going? And so uh, teaching to avoid error points like that. Short bursts of electrosurgery. Understanding relationships of the vessels, how close that right hepatic artery can be to the gallbladder, um, and the, the normal and aberrant relationships of the cystic duct artery, you know, et cetera. And then how to safely get the gallbladder off the liver bed using appropriate traction and counter traction. It's a, it's a stepwise fashion, and I think 
it takes it takes doing a lot of them. And then I would strongly echo the comments about claim geography that's already made. You have to see a lot to be able to interpret them properly and, and to be able to do it efficiently. Dr. Strasburg, are there any comments you would offer as someone who uh, works with the Patibillary Fellows and Mike, I know actually all the other panelists uh, are working with or are running MIS fellowships. Uh, any nuances for the more advanced learner that you work with at the fellowship level are special focus for those learners um, that you found very important? Well, um, in terms of cholecystectomy, I think it's really important to emphasize what Dr. Bittner uh, and Dr. Front have said uh, about terminating the operation without doing the cholecystectomy. Uh, in my opinion, the thing we need to teach people about really difficult cholecystectomies, how to do them, the answer is don't, uh, because it's unnecessary and it's dangerous. Uh, so um, that's one thing that that I would teach um, my fellows because we do get girls for difficult cholecystectomies. Part of the reason is our, our local CME, we've, we've taught our community surgeons not to do the really difficult cholecystectomies, but to, to stop and refer the patients if they feel uncomfortable about uh, doing a partial cholecystectomy. And so, I, I, like, I really would emphasize that point when it, when it comes to the very, very difficult cholecystectomy where you can't see the gallbladder, where it takes you half an hour to just even find the gallbladder, that, that's the person not to do the cholecystectomy on. And I think we could avoid a significant number of biliary injuries if we taught that. Wonderful points. Anyone else want to comment on that issue of teaching more advanced learners? Okay. Any comments that any of the panelists would like to uh, offer or questions to other panelists that you didn't get a chance to ask? Uh, we have time for that. I'm not seeing too many new questions showing up on the chat. So, Dr. Phillips, anything you would like to ask? No, this has been a very educational talk, but no specific questions. Dr. Bidner? I always learn stuff from you guys, and I appreciate it very much. Dr. Brunt, would you just make a comment maybe briefly as uh, about the fuse?
of your life experience has been very profitable for all of us. Uh, so we'll sign off now, and uh, let me also thank Steve at Case for his fine support of this program. Thanks to you all. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Audio recording for this meeting has ended.